Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams, still sheltering in place here in Bethesda, Maryland. And I think it's time for Gross Pat Challenge number 57. Are you ready? Okay, slide number one is tissue from a pig. How about a morphologic diagnosis, name the disease, and give me two causative agents. Okay, time's up on this one. We're looking at a cross section through the turbinate bones, probably taken at the level of the first molars, which is a great spot to do these cross sections. And you can see that on one side, you have total atrophy and loss of the normal turbinate bones. And you have severe atrophy on the other side. The name of this condition is progressive atrophic rhinitis. And at this stage, it's a combination of Bordetella bronchoseptica and the more important of the two bacteria, Pasteurella multocida, type D. You can see Bordetella bronchoseptica in the nasal passages of a lot of asymptomatic pigs and a lot of other species as well. And at best, it will cause a very mild atrophy of the turbinates in severe infections. It takes the presence, the uh, coexistence of Pasteurella type D, which secretes Pasteurella multocida type D, which secretes a very potent toxin to really get this particular condition rolling. Some people refer to them as atrophic rhinitis, which is a combination of Bordetella and probably some environmental factors like the dust, high ammonia levels, and then the real disease of progressive atrophic rhinitis, which is a combination of the two bacteria and environmental factors as well. These animals you can often see when they get to this point because their noses often are foreshortened, they turn up, they're wrinkly, um, or they're deviated to one or the other side. Progressive atrophic rhinitis in pigs. Slide number two is tissue from a cat. I just want a morphologic diagnosis on this one. Okay, time's up. Everyone should have picked up this one. We have intestines and a bit of the liver in the thoracic cavity. There's never a good time to have your intestines in your thoracic cavity. So this is a diaphragmatic hernia. Diaphragmatic hernias generally come in two flavors. Congenital ones often occur dorsally in the area of the tendinous insertion where the aorta and the esophagus um, penetrate the diaphragm. And that is one that often, in congenital cases, that tendon insertion will be missing or there'll be a large rent in it and a little bit of stuff will pop through there. The really bad ones are the ones that occur ventrally through the muscle belly of the diaphragm. Those are the ones that occur as a result of blunt trauma, getting hit by a car, in the case of a horse or cow, maybe you have to get hit by a dump truck uh, to rupture that. So this one is probably a... Uh, a traumatic one if I had to pick one or the other. Slide number three is from a horse. Can you name this agent? Okay, we're looking at the ileocecal valve of the horse, which is a very characteristic for this large cesto to attach. This is Anaplacephala perfoliata. There's another Anaplacephala, um, Anaplacephala magna, which which is much smaller, it's thinner, and it attaches uh, higher up in the small intestine. Anaplacephala perfoliata, I think it's a bad rep. It basically just attaches here at this part of the gut. It doesn't really do anything, but it gets blamed for all sorts of uh, colics and uh, cecal inversion and everything under the sun because it's tough to prove what causes those things. And when you have a bunch of very large worms right here. Everybody says, aha, that's gonna be it. But I think that uh, it really does very little. It's very well host adapted. It probably does very little in these particular animals. Slide number four is tissue from a dog. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Well, time's up. This is a, a difficult one if you've never seen it before. And we're, once again, we're looking at the, uh, the molars taken almost at the same level as the picture from the atrophic rhinitis. Um, we have the turbinates here and we have the maxilla here. And the maxilla is greatly expanded. It looks like there's a lot of hemorrhage. There are some cysts here. And what's happened is 
most of the uh, calcium in this bone has been resorbed due to a systemic need for calcium. It has been replaced by fibrous connective tissue, which is expanded. We get to see the blood vessels uh, in the uh, fibrous connective tissue much more than we do in bone. So it has this sort of reddish appearance. There is probably some hemorrhage due to a combination of uh, probably prosection. And then there might have been some instability of movement causing hemorrhages before this unfortunate animal died. So we've resorbed a lot of calcium from the bone, replacing it with fibrous connective tissue. That condition is known as fibrous uh, osteodystrophy. So I think for sake of ease, I, I might accept that as a morphologic diagnosis. Uh, so this will be bilaterally symmetrical uh, fibr maxillary fibrous osteodystrophy. Remember, whenever you see something that's bilaterally symmetrical, you want to think of two possibilities, generally either nutritional problems or toxic problems. And this is a nutritional problem, so the changes are going to be bilaterally symmetrical. But whenever I hear those words, bilaterally symmetrical, my mind automatically goes to toxic problems or nutritional problems. Okay, this level of uh, resorption, this level of swelling of the uh, of the bones of the face is usually seen more often in puppies and those with nutritional deficiencies of vitamin D and or calcium. Usually vitamin D because that's what brings in calcium. The body has a lot of calcium. It will mobilize it. You, you tend to see this uh, as an early sign in puppies as a result of nutritional deficiencies. Uh, you don't see it very often in old dogs and old dogs it is usually the result of re chronic renal disease and retention of phosphorus which uh, by Starling's law causes a decrease in the amount of circulating calcium the body recognizes that releasing parathyroid hormone and taking the calcium out of the bones to offset that but uh, those bones aren't swollen uh, in the face like you see in young puppies so Force me to, I probably guess this is a young puppy on a very marginal diet. Okay, maxillary fibrous osteodystrophy in the dog. Slide number five is a mouse. So let's say it's a Balbsi mouse, but it is an inbred mouse. And can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. When we look at laboratory animals and we see these large. Um, so one of the things that you need to think about is mammary tumors. Uh, if this was a rat, I would probably go with the mammary tumor. Mammary tumors in rats tend to be benign. Uh, even though they're large, they don't tend to ulcerate. In mice, they tend to be malignant due to activation of retroviruses. They often are uh, ulcerated, and they don't usually pop up uh, this high. This is a condition, if you're not familiar with it, um, you may want to go back and read a wonderful article in the 90s about these in veterinary pathology. And this tumor actually in this strain of mice, mouse arises in the, uh, uh, it arises in the salivary gland. This is a myoepithelioma. They get very large. Uh, they, and some people say they call them, and the question is, are they malignant or not? They don't metastasize. They get very large. Uh, the cells can look somewhat pleomorphic, but uh, they don't metastasize. So uh, this is salivary myoepithelioma in a mouse. It's one of those things that if you haven't heard about it before, you're probably not going to get to it um, without being familiar with that article or having it shown to you in one of these gross path challenges. Slide number six is tissue from a horse. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and the cause? Okay, time's up. This is another one that, uh, unless you're familiar with it, you might not get to just by looking at it. Uh, this is a cross section of the right kidney. Remember the right kidney of horses looks like a Valentine's heart. So they take a knife, they cut down through it, um, and we see these large areas of white material. Now, if you're not familiar with this agent, um, you may say, oh, it's lymphoma. 
and I probably have to give some good consideration to that, but uh, uh, lymphoma does not have this particular appearance. This is a uh, focally extensive chronic granulomatous nephritis due to migration of the rhabdidid nematode halocephalobus gingivalis. Halocephalobus gingivalis is an interesting parasite. Um, it generally lives free in decaying plant matter. Um, the males and the females live there happily. Now, if uh, an animal, a horse, uh, gets into that uh, uh, decaying plant material, say lies down on it, um, they can enter through a number of uh, the mucosal surfaces or an open wound, and they migrate along the adventitia of vessels to a number of very particular sites. Um, if they go into the mouth, they will burrow through the gingiva. That's how they get their name, Halocephalobus gingivalis. Um, they'll cause some gingival inflammation. But they can migrate along the adventitia of vessels into the brain. Or they commonly will get into the kidney and cause this very characteristic lesion. It's irregular. It doesn't have that lumpy, bumpy look that uh, lymphoma does. Um, they can also get into a number of other uh, organs, including uh, the adrenals. Um, they can go anywhere they want, but they seem to have a predilection to get up into the brain or the hypothalamus and into the kidneys. And this is a fantastic picture of one of those cases. Halocephalobus gingivalis. The interesting thing is that in animals, you never see the male worms. You only see the female worms. And I think the people, you know, thought that they were hermaphroditic early on, but they realized, no, the males are just there, stay at home in that decaying plant matter. So what you see are the, uh, are the larva and the female in these areas of granulomous inflammation and fibrosis. Okay, slide number seven is tissue from a goat. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. We're looking at a section of liver and there are multiple pyogranulomas scattered throughout. They are encapsulated. And if you told me that this was Carinobacterium pseudotuberculosis, which we talked about in a, a ghost challenge just a couple of days ago, we talked about how it's usually a, a bacterium of the skin, and uh, sometimes when animals are sheared or clipped, um, uh, a certain percentage of those animals will develop systemic abscesses. And goats are susceptible to that too. They tend to be a little more liquefied in goats uh, as opposed to the characteristic onion shell appearance in sheep. If you said this coronavirus tuberculosis in a goat, we'll give you full credit. This is sort of an outlier. It's from old Wednesday slide conference, and this is Rhodococcus equi in goats. And occasionally you will see Rhodococcus equi in other species other than horses. Um, it's been documented in, in man. It's been documented in small ruminants, often those who are housed with, uh, with horses or move into an area where horses have been and the horses are gone, but they've left a Rhodococcus equi, a very cordy bacterium, in the uh, environment. So uh, Rhodococcus equi in goats is not an a unheard of thing. And uh, if it's your first time, well, you heard it here. And I hope you will put that on your differential diagnosis for this type of lesion in the goat. But I can tell you that when I see something like this, first thing I'm gonna think about is Carinobacterium pseudotuberculosis. Okay, slide number eight is a fish. It is some type of fish, like a fathead minnow, or I don't know my fish very well. Um, can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and the cause? Okay, time's up. We're looking at a couple of spots on this fish. Here's a really large one, the back of this fin. I think there are a couple of other spots here and maybe back here. This is a viral disease that is seen in a wide a variety of fish. You can see it in uh, uh, fish in your, your freshwater aquarium at home. You can see it in the wild. And this is uh, a disease that goes by the name of iridovirus. It is also the 
name of the agent, Hysine aerovirus. And there are a lot, not a lot of aeroviruses that we think about in animal species. They're a lot more popular in arthropods and insects, but this is a good one. And the morphologic diagnosis is a focally extensive proliferative a dermatitis. This does not affect the scales. This affects the fibroblasts down in the dermis, and the presence of the bacteria causes massive hypertrophy of those cells. And what's even prettier is they have large viral intracytoplasmic inclusions. So they cause these sort of cauliflower like proliferations uh, in the dermis of fish. So, Hysine irritovirus. Slide number nine is tissue from a weedling pig. We'll say four to six weeks. Oh, I gotta ask you for something, don't I? Well, how about a morphologic diagnosis uh, and a cause and name another affected organ. Okay, time's up. We're looking at obviously the brain. There is severe congestion of the brain. And because this is a weanling pig, you can tell that all this white material down in the, the sulci is not fibrosis, which we see in old animals, but it is suppurative exudate, or it's fibrin, or it's both. And I just love the congestion in this case. In this case of Glasser's disease, a disease that is caused by three bacteria uh, in swine, and uh, um, the three bacteria that you need to know, Streptococcus suis, particularly type 2, uh, Haemophilus parasuis, and Mycoplasma hyorrhinus. The one that I like this one for, although it could be any of them, really is the one that has the most congestion. Um, uh, the brain is the most effective. Sometimes you actually don't see a lot of congestion or pus on the outside, but you see large areas containing tremendous number of neutrophils and vasculitis on the inside. And that's strepsilis. Strepsilis is the worst of all of them. You get the best lesions. And if you're looking for another organ, look for any of the potential spaces and spaces in the body, and they're going to have fiber and pus. So in addition to the meninges, you have obviously the pleura, um, the peritoneum, because these animals will have a lot of fiber in there. Um, don't forget about the joints. They're another potential space that you will see fibrin and separative inflammation of these animals. So I like this one for strepsuis, but if you put any of the other ones, I really cannot, uh, cannot fault you on that. Um, I think that uh, Haemophilus parasuis gives you a lot of fibrin. I think of the three, Mycoplasma hyoris gives you the, the weakest uh, lesions of these, but I gotta accept all of them, and you gotta know those agents. Those three agents, strepsuis, Mycoplasma hyoris, and Haemophilus parasuis. Don't think of Haemophilus as a wimpy little uh, uh, bacterium because you have to uh, give it uh, blood auger and a strip of uh, other material in there. It's really tough to grow. It's not a wimpy bacteria because remember, they renamed Haemophilus actinobacillus. Actinobacillus pleuronomonia used to be Haemophilus pleuronomonia, and it is a bad actor in pigs. Okay, finally, we're gonna end up with slide number 10. This is tissue from a crea. And a crea is a baby llama or a baby alpaca. In this case, it is a baby llama. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. This is a slam dunk. If you know anything about llamas, you know that the biggest problem that they face is within the first 30 seconds of life because they have so many congenital defects. It's crazy. I once saw uh, Dr. Tawfiq Abelail of the uh, Colorado State University. Great guy, knows everything about llamas and alpacas. And uh, he gave a two hour lecture on diseases of llamas and alpacas. And the first hour and a half were just the birth defects that you see in these animals. And this is a very common birth defect that you will see in these species and a lot of other species. And we are looking actually, once again, straight up into the turbinate bones are up in here somewhere. We're looking into the nasal cavity. You should not be able to see that. Um, and what we have is palatoschisis. Palatoschisis is a cleft palate where the two lateral palatine shells do not come together and join. And so these animals, when they drink milk, um, 
they actually ingest basically goes up into the nasal cavity and they get severe rhinitis. Um, some with smaller defects may be able to figure out how to drink milk, but when they get into the part where they're actually eating roughage or whatever, it packs up in there. It's never a, a great thing to have a cleft palate, and uh, it's bad for these particular animals especially. Okay, well that brings us to the end of Gross Path Challenge number 57. Hope to be back here with you tomorrow with Gross Path Challenge 58. I look forward to it. I hope that you are looking forward to it. I hope that all of you are being extremely safe out there and uh, that we all have a long time together to do more of these lectures and more of these Gross Path Challenges. Until then, it's Bruce Williams signing off.